of the attack which happened last night here in Kiev just 15 minutes away from the center that's crazy this is totally insane Russia's invasion of the Ukraine marks the most significant warfare seen in Europe since World War II. Tim McMillan, co-founder of The Debrief and defense journalist, joins me to discuss weapons of modern warfare, propaganda tactics used by Russia, how the Western world is imposing economical sanctions, and will it help? Along with the doomsday clock being 100 seconds closer to midnight. Join us as we get Rebelliously Curious. Tim, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. This is the first time I've had somebody from the debrief on the show, so I'm just happy it's you. Um, it's a topic, maybe that's mm -hmm. not the easiest topic to talk about, but it is a topic that you know very well because you've been writing and talking about defense for a very long time. So good to have you on the show. It's good to be on here. I can't believe I'm the first, but yeah, I, I thought it was just the first time I've been invited on, man. Right. You're the first, but not the last. We'll get Mike and X, and then we get Chris, <laughs> and then we'll get MJ. So, okay, um, but this topic just makes sense for you to talk about. Um, so, the, what I want to start, we're going to start really broad uh, because it, and just having a little bit of background for people that might not be fully caught up to date of what's going on in Ukraine and how it started. So, my first mm -hmm. question to you then is, you know, why did Russia take Ukraine? Sure. Yeah, I think the thing that is important for people to understand, because a lot of people have come into this uh, very recently, because you're seeing this massive full scale invasion. We're looking at, uh, you know, the largest European war since World War Two It's a big deal. And so a lot of people right. have come into it. But it's important to understand that, uh, you know, this is not the start of it. And in fact, you know, this all is a continuation of, of what occurred in 2014 when Russia initially invaded Ukraine. So in 2014, Russia, you know, using uh, proxy forces or the separatist backed groups in Eastern the Donbass region, uh, you know, Russia came in uh, and actually helped uh, facilitate and in some cases actually had soldiers on the ground engaged in an invasion on Eastern, the Eastern Donbass region of Ukraine, which is largely uh, predominantly ethnic uh, Russians and Russian speaking Ukrainians, and then also seizing the uh, Black Sea uh, Peninsula of Crimea. And so they annexed Crimea you know, by what is largely considered a bogus referendum. Uh, they annexed Crimea and took that into the Russian Federation. And then since 2014, they have been supporting uh, two separate uh, separatist groups uh, who are claiming, you know, these so-called separatist territories as being detached from Ukraine, whereas Ukraine and the greater world collectively, for the most part, uh, all acknowledges these are technically areas that are sovereign Ukraines. They've just been, they're currently occupied and being backed by this proxy force. So this is really something that's been going on for eight years. This is not something that's new. Uh, I, other than now what we're witnessing is a, a full-scale military invasion uh, to really the extent we haven't seen, uh, you know, it, it's, it's inarguably the biggest war that's occurred in Europe since World War II. But I think that uh, even looking at uh, the United States when they invaded Iraq in 2003, uh, or even if you look at the Vietnam War, so some of the major conflicts that have gone on in the last 77 years, I think a ca case can easily be made that this is still the biggest in terms of what we're looking at. There's a little bit of a different dynamic than what we had in those two others and any other major conflict people can think of. So this is a, it's a big deal. And I think um, for a lot of people, especially in Europe, because I live in Europe, I live in Germany, uh, and a lot of people, even in the defense world, uh, you know, whether you, you officially work in the defense or intelligence capacity for the government, or you're just kind of a defense wonk like me who pays attention to it. And um, this is something that 
everybody's always planning for and, and contingencies for this could happen, but I'm not sure anybody really thought it would happen to this scale. I, I think that for a lot of people felt like this large scale conventional warfare was a thing of the past. And so to see this now and kind of where we're at right now um, with no end in sight, it's a really precarious position to be in right now. Um, but uh, you know, to give to, to answer your original question before I start diverting off, uh, this is really a continuation of, of what's going on there, and reasoning behind it, you know, <laughs> depends on who you ask. <laughs> if you ask uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, <laughs> you know, he up until February twenty third said Russia had no intention on invading Ukraine. And then early in the morning on February 24th, he announced a, quote, special military operation uh, to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. So if you were to ask uh, the Russian Federation, they are currently not even engaged in an invasion or a war. They're engaged in a special military operation to denazify and demilitarize. Two things that are really subjective. And you know, how do you objectively measure that? In addition to the fact that, uh, you know, <laughs> once you look past those really exciting buzzwords like denazify, well, yeah, Nazis are bad, let's get rid of them. Um, you realize that Ukraine, uh, their president, President Zelensky, is Jewish. Like he has family members who, uh, you know, were killed in the Holocaust. Like, you know, Ukraine has a very large Jewish population. You know, Ukraine suffered tremendously at the hands of the real, uh, you know, Hitler, Nazi Germany. And so uh, this idea that you're denazifying is like, what? This doesn't even make any sense. Like, wh where is this evidence for this? Uh, and, and, you know, their evidence is, and we can probably get into that a little bit uh, if you want to at some point, but, uh, you know, it's, it's highlighting individuals who are in Ukraine uh, and even uh, members of a small segment of their National Guard forces who espouse neo-Nazi and far-right views. Uh, you know, the Azov Battalion has been the one that people often highlight. That's the one that's used in Russian propaganda quite frequently. And inarguably, there are members of that. And in fact, their, their official symbol uh, mimics the Wolf's Angel symbol, which is used by the SS Nazis. There are, and their founder, who are indeed, they espouse neo-Nazi views. I don't think that's inarguable. Um, however, just like any country in the world, you know, the actual people who espouse far-right neo-Nazi views uh, is, is such a small, minute proportion of the actual Ukrainian population that, frankly, I, I haven't done the math, but I, I would be willing to bet you money right here, you know, the United States has more far-right neo-Nazi-leaning, uh, even armed people than Ukraine does, but they've used that. Uh, consistently as their rationale and basis behind it. And that's um, Russia using that, so, you're saying, yeah. Yes, correct. That's not the real reason, <laughs> because it's not true. You know, the, if you were to look at it again, the, it, it, I, I can't stress enough, uh, there are probably more uh, far-right neo-Nazi leaning people in Canada. You know, there's probably more in Germany here. There's probably more in the UK than you are in, in Ukraine. At a minimum, uh, it would be comparable. If you look at population sizes. So, you know, we're not invading Canada. <laughs> so that's not the real reason this is going on. But we're seeing, so there is a separatist conversation and you have like Eastern mm -hmm. Ukraine and you have Western Ukraine that is split because you do have people that are in the Ukraine that believe in the separation. You know, what are you seeing in your ear on the ground floor and hearing what people from Ukraine are saying about the war that's happening? Obviously, you know, we're getting a country that is being destroyed and you're getting a lot of people that are not agreeing with this, but what about the separatists? Um, I imagine they fleed, but what are you hearing internally and on the ground floor from Ukrainian citizens? Sure, so, I mean, your separatist regions of the Donbass and Lumbas region areas, they're involved in this conflict. And in fact, they are fighting as proxy forces. So on the Eastern edge of Ukraine, they're involved in this war. Uh, obviously they're not, uh, they don't carry the same capacity as the Russian military, but they're very much involved in this. And, you know, if you were to listen to their leadership, so their uh, 
self-appointed leadership, of course, you know, there's uh, genocide was being committed against them, that Ukraine was wiping out the, their citizens, all this type of stuff. Um, in terms of what the average person and citizen feels like in those Donbass regions, uh, that's very hard to measure. Because you know, it's not like in most Western countries where there's a there's freedom of press, there's ease of access to to actually just speak to people and say, hey, so how do you like things now? How are things doing? Um, you know, people are a afraid of that because uh, you know they are persecuted for that, and b there's just not freedom of press in those regions. And so, how a lot of the people who are living in the separatist regions genuinely feel it is hard to measure. Uh, at the same time, we can look at other things that, that I think are very interesting that maybe haven't been highlighted enough. But, um, for example, the, the former uh, FSB, the Federal Security Services Commander or Colonel for Russia, uh, Igor, gosh, his last name escapes me at the minute. I knew it would. But Igor, let's just call him Igor. He was <laughs> the one in charge. He was he was. He was Putin's point man in the Donbass in 2014. And really, he was the first defense minister for the Donbass People's Republic. So he helped facilitate uh, this, this proxy invasion and in the, in the seizure of these lands effectively to become vassals for the Russian Empire. Uh, you know, that was his job in 2014, arguably the man most responsible for the Donbass war. In 2020, he's since retired. In 2020, you know, he did an interview for Russian TV. So this is not Western propaganda. This is in Russian. He's Russian, <laughs> Russian TV, where he acknowledged that uh, you know, the situation in Donbass had become, quote, a dump, and that the people in Donbass were worse off now than they were beforehand, or if Russia had just annexed them. So wow. he, he didn't go fully and say we shouldn't have done it. But he said the people there are worse off, like the situation is worse off. And it is, I mean, his words exactly, it's a dump. So we can infer from what he's saying <laughs> into what the people in those regions, you know, would be saying. You know, if the guy who, who helped, if anybody's got any reason to, to own this prize and want to make it look good, it would be the guy who made it happen. But he's calling it a dump. So, wow. you know, you do, you do have your separatist pro-Russian backfighters who are all for it, but then w the real victims in any war, no matter what, are those, those citizens, those innocent people on the ground, how they feel and what they want. I think at this point, we're, we're looking at a month into this invasion, um, they probably just don't want war, period, whatever that means. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that makes sense. I can imagine, you know, nobody does. Nobody wants to be part of that. No one wants to have their family affected by war. You know, what are surrounding countries that are not part, not part of NATO, such as Belarus and Georgia? You know, what are their, you know, they're a little more attached to Russia. What are their parts right now in this war? Are they playing a part? Or are they kind of stepping back? Sure. Yeah. Belarus ha has, has arguably been the, the, closest Russian ally to all of this. Now, Belarus plays a very interesting part in this because though they uh, you know, seem to be close ties and friends with Russia and their president, Lushenko, uh, has been seen chumming it up with old uh, Vladimir Putin and, and having a good chuckle at times in recent history, that is all really recent history. Two years ago, Belarus and Russia weren't friends. Lushenko was his own strong man. Uh, Lushenko is the longest running European dictator going back to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So he's been in power now for 30 plus years. And uh, you know, they weren't buddies. They weren't friends. However, two years ago, uh, when uh, they held their democratic elections, <laughs> uh, you know, almost, uh, I think, universally, universally uh, independent observers, uh, Lushenko was beat out in the fair and honest election. However, <laughs> he refused to leave and they played the whole, uh, tried to play something we've seen familiar in the United States for us Americans of this is all a sham, this is all a hoax, this is a, and, and you know, he was successful in that to an extent, but, but a lot of civil unrest in Belarus, you know, hundreds of Thousands of protesters came out. It, it even, I remember watching it on the news and it's surreal because Lushenko fled the presidential palace and then showed back up with an AK-47 in his hands. I mean, it's surreal. You're looking at it going, what's he doing? And so uh, Vladimir Putin uh, came in and bailed him out. 
you know, came in with his, you know, Russian war machine and, and uh, helped bring in his National Guard troops and, and just pacify, you know, all this protest and help solidify Lashenko's reign over Belarus. Now, not your original question, but I would imagine there's probably some really good information that all of that dissent and all of that chaos was probably started by Putin in the first place and then you know, coming in to be the savior. But uh, that's when their relationship enter, you know, they, they start firming up. And so Belarus is part in this war is they have largely played a staging ground. A majority of uh, Russia's forces, especially along the Kiev axis, so across the, the north uh, western side uh, of the border, uh, have come down. They, they entered Ukraine. They invaded through Belarus. A large number of their forces were staged there, so they've allowed them to be staged there. Uh, they've also allowed their medium range missile systems to be staged there. So a lot of the missile strikes on especially the capital city of Kiev have come from Belarus. And there's been a lot of talk, and I've had a lot of these conversations with people I know in the intelligence community and people watching it. Um, there's been uh, a lot, uh, there's, there's considerable indications that Vladimir Putin and Russia would love Belarus to join this war right, as a real active participant. That has not happened thus far. And I think the reason for that is because, just like I said, in, in, in Lashenko's sham election, he's not, uh, he, he, I jokingly, but but it's not really a joke. He's hanging on by a wing in an AK-47. He's not popular. And the Belarusian people don't agree with the war in Ukraine. I just saw a Chatham House uh, poll survey yesterday that said 3% of Belarusians would support a military invasion. Wow. So they don't support it. Um, there's been unconfirmed reports of actual uh, them trying to put Russian commanders in charge of Belarusian troops to go in and there being riots and, you know, people going AWOL, people refusing to do that. I can't, that hasn't been confirmed, but I would imagine um, that's, you know, that's not too far fetched. And then at the same time, the Belarusian, the average Belarusian people are really being sapped away in a war that they don't agree with, but their land is being used. And I think one of the things that has taken a big toll, especially for people up on the, the southern border of Belarus, and, and I've talked to some Belarusians, uh, and I reported on this, is that a lot of the hospitals, uh, the morgues are being inundated with dead Russian soldiers. So they're busing dead Russian soldiers there to the point where it, it's shocking, it's disturbing. There's buses that are coming through that are carrying dead Russian soldiers and going on these trains. and. Uh, I mean, it's, people are, you know, you can imagine if that's going on in your town and to know that there's a war like that going on the border. So Belarus at this point has been arguably the closest ally to Russia at this point, but largely just providing, you know, geographical support and letting them use their land um, for Russia to launch operations. I'm not sure at this point we could see much more than that. If we were going to, we probably already, already would have seen it. Yeah, and maybe it's smart that Belarus stays out of it for now in context of actually joining the war. <laughs> it's probably a better choice yeah. yeah, as a small country. I want to get into propaganda now because we hear a lot about Russian propaganda and, you know, what is Russian propaganda? What have you seen? You know, we've, in one story that I've seen that's come across Twitter, I think MJ Benias tweeted this actually from our team that there was a woman that ran um, with a sign during like a news broadcast, a Russian news broadcast and was protesting the war. So she was kind of trying to stop that propaganda, what was happening. So what are you seeing that is, you know, government propaganda happening and then also news propaganda that's happening on behalf of Russia? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that is an integral part of Russia's entire system. And I think to really understand how propaganda and more importantly, information warfare is such a significant part of, of governance in Russia is to understand that, you know, Vladimir Putin, who's been their president now since 1999, uh, aside from a four year stint as prime minister, but he was still in charge. Uh, he's a former KGB man. Uh, he, he was uh, briefly for about a year head of their SS FSB, which is the successor to the KGB. He's a security service guy. Okay, so not like, you know, FSB is not like, uh, and even the KGB, to an extent, is kind of like the CIA people think of, but yet their, their focus is internal state security, not 
external in intelligence. It's controlling the population that people are manipulating, making sure, you know, it's a lot of the internal uh, oppression, repression stuff. And a big part of that is manipulation. And so that we see that here. So that goes in line with what Vladimir Putin's thinking is. And in fact, his inner circle, his inner sanctum of the officials who are at the highest levels of the bureaucracy around him, they're all former security service people. You know, they, or if you look at somewhere like North Korea has created a, a military, military state, you know, they're a hermit kingdom with a military state. Uh, Russia has really, through Putin, has created a security state. And so for them, pop propaganda is integral because information is power, it's warfare. And, and to them, shaping and manipulating uh, not just uh, external international view, but their own citizens view is huge. And so for this war, you know, that kind of propaganda and, and setting the stage for how uh, they want to shift reality, that, that began, I mean, it's been going on as they set the stage for this for some time, but that I began from moment one, um, you know, when I said that uh, Vladimir Putin said announced he was, they were launching a special military operation, you know, not a war, not an invasion, right. especially you're like, what does that mean? You know, that you know, normally you think that sounds like something really small, like, you know, a couple of guys are going and raiding a house. You know, like, what does that mean? Uh, you know, they have since launching that. So they, they, they manage and govern people and in information warfare through a couple of ways. Really, a, a, what's called a leashes and clubs mentality. I mean, they ring in tight leash on people. And then if you get off, try to get off that leash, you get the club. And so they've enacted a lot of leashes that have given them clubs. Uh, and so aside from just lying, we'll, I'll go into what they've done to make sure those leashes are in place, is that they've actually passed laws since this invasion began in which it is illegal uh, for anybody in the media, anybody in the public, anyone <laughs> to describe it as anything other than a special military operation. So if you were to walk outside and, and we have videos, this has happened. You know, if you hold up a sign that says no war, you will be arrested. And, and in fact, the maximum penalty for the law that they pass is 15 years in prison. <laughs> so if you even just call this a war, you could be subject to being arrested and imprisoned for 15 years. Uh, you, you can't call it an invasion. It is a special military operation. So there goes your leash. And if you step out of that line, you get the club. And, and I think the last time I looked, it, there was you know, close to 16,000, I believe, 16,000 Russians who've been arrested for protesting the war. And so- Wow, geez, it's a lot. You know, I, yeah. And, and I mean, I, I've seen, and that's like, I've that's subject to, to 15 years too. It's not just protesting. It's knowing protesting that you might get 15 years in jail too. Correct. Correct. You know, they will probably most not do that, not because they don't want to, but rather, uh, you know, it's very costly <laughs> to imprison people and especially prison people for 15 years. Uh, so they'll come up with some other club that will make sure that people aren't doing that. And so there you're controlling the information space. So now you, you're, you're pushing out any external information that might come in. Now you start crafting your own narrative. So now you, know, you don't have to worry about reality interjecting this. Now you, you're creating reality. And so through, it's important to understand there is no independent media really anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, all the independent media since the war uh, in Russia has been run off. They've been shut down. Uh, so now you only have state-backed media, which it's, it, you can kind of comically see uh, essentially reports from press sheets that are handed to them from the Kremlin because they report the same things, a lot of the same quotes, same, like you're like, you'll see, you'll see op-eds, opinion pieces that'll be published by two, three, or four different Russian media outlets that are all identical. You're like, what, the same person have the same opinion all at once? Like what happened here? So they get this information that feeds it into this and they control the idea uh, of, of what exactly is going on there. You know, they present it as a, um, this, they present, they've been presenting this largely as a peacekeeping mission, a liberation mission to free the poor people of Ukraine from these Nazi oppressors. Um, you know, when they have engaged in things that are inarguably war crimes, for example, uh, they, they intentionally targeted and bombed a uh, maternity hospital 
in Maripol. Uh, ended up at least one woman and her unborn child died as a result. Um, they intentionally targeted that and bombed it, but they claimed that it was Ukrainian nationalists and Ukrainian Nazis who bombed it to make Russia look bad. And uh, you know they they have bombed a, a uh, theater that was being used as a shelter with children and, and families. They claimed again. I mean, that's usually any time they engage in something like that, where they're destroying uh, civilian infrastructure, residential houses, or something like a hospital. They always say that it was the other guys. The other guys did it, you know, trying to make us look bad. I think with them, one of the things that's very disturbing in their propaganda, and, and I've been monitoring this and, and watching this, and oftentimes uh, when I catch it, I, I let <laughs> I put that information out there, whether it's on Twitter or, or in our articles for the debrief, is that they telegraph before they're about to commit a war crime or do something horrific. Uh, for example, they said they, they typically start on social media where you'll see all these pro-Russian uh, people, some may be bots, some may be just Kremlin trolls who start seeding the narrative. And so with the, the, uh, with the maternity hospital bombing in particular, you started seeing a lot of chatter a couple of days early about, you know, and even including pictures that supposedly showed tanks from the Azov Battalion hiding at the, um, at the maternity hospital. And it's not even good. That's the important thing to understand. Like those photos in particular, uh, a, a 60 second Google image search and you find out those photos are from, I think when I tracked them down, 2016, 17, they were taken in Eastern Ukraine. Like they're not even where they say they are, doesn't matter. <laughs> but they're going to say that. And they, they put that there. So they seed that out a couple of days early. And then like clockwork, uh, they will legitimize it by, by giving someone with authority backing it. And so for the maternity hospital, their ambassador to the United Nations Security Council said it, you know, to the world, <laughs> literally and said it. Yet they're putting people in this maternity hospital. You know, that's how bad these people are. And then once it's reached that legitimization stage, um, it's usually uh, you know, it's usually about 24 to 48 hours. They'll they'll commit the act, and uh, it, it's it's like clockwork. I, I you know they did this with a um, ammonia gas leak, an attack on an ammonia gas facility near Sumy, in Ukraine. Um, I saw the chatter. And then when I heard the, um, I think it was the, actually the Russian Minister of Defense uh, did an interview saying that they were, they were watching Ukrainian nationals uh, were preparing to rig the ammonia plant for, uh, to blow it up and, you know, to try to cause civilian deaths and everything. I posted that on Twitter. I said, here's exactly where they're going to do it. <laughs> they're going to do it within 24 to 48 hours. I went to bed, you know, by the end of that day, I went to bed, I woke up that morning and there were reports from the mayor and Sumi saying there had been an attack on the ammonia plant. There's ammonia leak, you know, everybody's shelter in place. And so it's very consistent there. And I think that's what's frightening is, is that, you know, they don't try to hide it, but they try to craft an alternate reality around it beforehand. Um, and so you have that. <laughs> you also have, and you, you've seen this a lot, uh, this is you know, just classic Russian propaganda is they do something called fire hosing, meaning they just spread out all sorts of, a lot of it is just nonsense. Like if you were to listen to it or hear it, you go, that doesn't even make sense. Like there's no way that's true. <laughs> there's, that, that's totally false. That doesn't matter. Like they try to seed out as much nonsense as humanly possible because it becomes overwhelming. It becomes overwhelming and people don't, once you see so many things that are lies, you just get frustrated and you go, I don't wanna, you know, I'm out. Like, this is ridiculous. Or you start questioning your, your own version of reality. You're like, what is real? Uh, because there's so much nonsense that, that's put out there. They try to just reach people's bandwidth for information and to the point where they just go, I give up. You know, it's like trying to study calculus or something where you just go, okay, it's gotten too hard. I'm out. And because, and that's the object is to make the information space so difficult to discern. Yeah. And you have a country that has been living, you know, under a lot of propaganda 
you know, and, and they're just conditioned to it now. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. You know, we've spoken about this before, you know, off, um, off this interview about just, you know, having a difference between Western propaganda and, you know, us saying, for example, yeah, like the sky is blue and us definitely knowing that it's not, um, compared to a country that has been living throughout propaganda and has been controlled by it for years. So, um, the question, the next question I want to go into though, with you, uh, would be, and I, I think it's important to bring it up that we look at both sides, you know, is there American propaganda that's happening right now that's being fed to the West uh, about the East, let's say, um, for example, maybe one could be or could not be, you know, I've seen the Washington Post speak high, a lot about this um, in recent weeks about Putin's mentality and his mindset currently, you know, saying that he hasn't been stable and that he has like not uh, been around people for the past, you know, two years for the pandemic. Um, and that has maybe caused some mental health issues that might be going on or something else, you know, is that Western propaganda? Because it could look like that to, the, to somebody that understands propaganda. Um, and if not, and it might not be, what would be American propaganda that we would see happening during this war? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> no, that's a great question. And uh, the first one, just to talk about the example you gave on the Washington Post, I think for 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 longtime Putin observers, and, and I am one. Uh, you know, I, I've watched Putin and, and Russia and their military and the Kremlin and, and European defense uh, and geopolitics has really been the area of my focus for a great number of years. And as a former criminal behavioral profiler, uh, you know, I have watched Putin for a long time and trying to profile him, and, and even especially more recently, which involves listening to his speeches a lot <laughs> and reading what he's writing. And just like anybody else, he's a human being. And so, uh, you know, anything that we say and we present in public, uh, any of us is neither 100% true and 100% a lie. <laughs> So, you know, we always present a version of ourselves we want people to see. And so it's getting that middle road that they say consistently over and over. And to an extent, uh, I think uh, where you've seen stuff in the Washington Post or even myself, you know, I, I did a very lengthy breakdown of uh, the most, the last, most recent extensive speech that Putin gave uh, and in kind of what does that mean and looking at it. I don't, I think from a behavioral standpoint, the things that we've seen and the things that he's done, the things that he said, there, there's definitely a noticeable change in his behavior, thoughts, and, and opinions and processes since 2011, 2014, when that began. Now, is that indicative of mental illness or anything else? I don't know. But I, I think there's certainly, uh, there's certainly been instances where it is worthwhile to question, <laughs> you know, that. But so that aside, so I'm, I only throw that out to say that in, in some of these instances where you've seen people question his his mental health, uh, I don't know that that's propaganda as much as, particularly if they're using legitimate information and saying like this is this doesn't make sense, you know what is going on here. But at the same time, you know we have an active war going on. This is a a real war. Wars are not simply fought on the ground. They're not fought in the air. And they're not fought in the ocean. They're fought in the information space. You know, information warfare is a thing, and, and you know, the information space is a warfare domain, and it's a very important domain. So uh, you kept mentioning American propaganda. That's not what we need to worry about as much it, when we're talking about the other side of Russia as Ukrainian propaganda, because there is a lot of that going on, because you know, it's a part of war, and it's necessary. So support, morale, you know, having your side feel good, feel like they can be victorious. And in particularly in the case of Ukraine, they're very highly dependent on Western military aid, economic aid. And so having the Western world on their side, or more importantly, invested in the conflict is very significant to them. And so absolutely, you, you, you see uh, propaganda from the Ukrainian side, um, you know, not to the same extent that you see with Russia's side per se, but you'll see things like, I think, uh, you know, one good example would be every day I, I listen, you know, they give their daily briefings from the Ukrainian general staff and we get the numbers for how many Russian soldiers have been estimated to be killed. I think the last was like 16,000. That's, you know, that's pretty high. <laughs> it's probably Very not high. that high. There's reason to believe it is extremely high. 
and, and I would say, you know, for a long time when, when Ukraine was first giving those figures, I said, you know, they're just saying that, to, you know, make them sound, sound like they're doing better than they are. But uh, there is actually now a lot of information that suggests it, it very well could be in the 10, 12, 13, 14,000 range in reality. Um, but you'll see that kind of stuff. You'll see um, some of the things that really grabbed hold early on was uh, there was this meme and kind of uh, theme going out there of the ghost of Ukraine. This, you know, a fighter pilot, a Ukrainian fighter pilot had made six kills in one day, that type of stuff, you know, totally make believe. But at the same time, they're using that in those instances. These are, they're like military, it's like the, the old, um, Greek fables, uh, you know, Hercules. These are like these, these stories that, that rally your people and get you excited. Uh, the other one that really, uh, you know, has become kind of a motto and it did really well was the, uh, the, the Russian warship, go fuck yourself. I don't know if you, you saw that. No, explain to us what that is, just in case someone else hasn't either. Sure. Snake Island, which is uh, about 80 miles south of uh, Ukraine, very small little uh, island, basically a research center island where they had two dozen border guards stationed there in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, supposedly a Russian warship came up to the island and, you know, told the uh, told the border guard to surrender. And the, the, the border guards response was, you know, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. And there's actually audio of this event. Now, the audio itself, I'm not sure is not, you know, I don't know that that's fake, uh, but, and so, uh, you know, there has been audio released of it that, that you hear this event go down. And in fact, it sounds pretty authentic. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the consequences or outcome of this event was supposedly that the, the Russian warship shelled the island and everyone was killed. So these defenders of Snake Island were, immortalized and it was just this epic you know go f yourself moment it, it, you know that it showed ukrainian resolve and determination and willingness to die rather than surrender and die for freedom uh and i think it has since come out <laughs> that actually that those border guard were captured <laughs> so i believe wow. they're prisoners of war now <laughs> so they weren't killed in this heroic event type thing but the story behind it is so compelling. It's, you know, it's, it's like a movie and everything. And so you hear that it's compelling for, for outside observers. And again, it rallies their own people. It rallies the Western world in this really compelling story. So you're gonna have that kind of stuff. You're gonna have that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you're going to have uh, some cartoonish kind of, uh, descriptions of russians and you know i think like the, the big thing is calling them orcs right now like uh, the lord of the rings and you're gonna have that and that is propaganda but i think it's important for people to understand that um it's part of war but that's also what journalists and reporters and a lot of them who have been on the ground um really do a really good job of, of shifting through that and so any reporters and anybody, anybody susceptible to propaganda. And I think the Russian warship is a good example because it's such a fun story. Uh, who, you know, I think we reported on it. Who wouldn't report on that? You know, and it's coming from an official source. They're like, hey, they said it. Uh, so anybody susceptible to that. But I think uh, there's still, in terms of what's been going on the ground, I think we have been getting some, some good reporting on that. We're, we're not sure. seeing... We're not seeing from the other side. We're not seeing instances where uh, you know, not, there's no evidence of them uh, it being engaged in what Russia has often accused them of. So setting up war crimes and blaming it on Russia. So you're not seeing any of that, um, but you're going to have it. And they said information, it, it's a warfare domain. We're going to see that. For sure. And we look at Zelensky right now and just to kind of bridge into mm -hmm. Ukrainian propaganda, potentially, you know, influencing the, the West. Uh, we look at corporate companies and I'm going to bring Elon Musk into this because right in the beginning of the war, I believe the war started February 24th, you know, right around that time we had Zelensky send a tweet out to Elon Musk asking for help and to give Ukrainians free internet uh, using Starlink. And so then Elon Musk tweets back saying terminals are on their way. 
Now, here's my question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Zelensky, you know, he could have actually called Elon Musk instead of sending out a tweet. He probably could have called Tesla and figured, even though I know Tesla doesn't have a very strong communications, you know, Elon Musk pretty much does all the communications on that side. Um, he doesn't have, he has a team, but I don't think it's the, the largest team. I think he got rid of it earlier. Um, maybe that's changed, but in any way, with that said, you know, you, he didn't have to tweet Elon Musk. He probably could have called them. Do you think that Zelensky was using that as, you know, looking at him and saying, this is what's happening in the West and showing some partnership between, you know, the West and the East, or sorry, the West and Ukraine. Um, and was it, was it a political move? It's probably more of what I'm asking. Or do you think it was a move of desperation? Sure. No, no. I, I think that, um, it, you know, I'm having to interpret it, but uh, A, is it a very savvy political move? Absolutely. I say that with a caveat that the, it, there, the situation always exists, just like any of us. Um, you know, Zelensky, Putin, all these people are human beings. They're just people. And so could Zelensky have been you know, sitting at his desk and just tweeted on his phone because it came to his mind? Sure. Is it a savvy political move? Absolutely. So even if it was the latter and that was just a totally organic event, it shows why somebody becomes president, becomes a leader, because they do think astutely and you know, to these regards. And so it's it's definitely astute because yeah, you, you have a situation here where Ukraine um, is, is facing a, an, an unjust war of aggression. You know, they were invaded. They didn't do anything. You know, it's somebody is, has broken to your house for no reason, you know, they're, and they're facing a lot of death and destruction. So, you know, in the kind of meta narrative that, that, that always gets worked out when you have war uh, of the good guys versus the bad guys, Ukraine is the good guy. You know, they weren't doing anything and then Russia came in and invaded them. So they're the good guys. So, it, you know, using that to your advantage by saying as the good guys, hey, I need some help and doing that publicly, uh, particularly to commercial entities, you know, whether it's Elon Musk or, or anyone else like that. Obviously, it serves benefit because those companies know, ooh. You know, it's just, we're talking about it right now because Elon Musk did provide the Starlinks and everything. And so Elon, who is is known for being a bit centric um, and, and saying and doing things that raise eyebrows uh, by doing that, suddenly, you know, people who may have had a more negative opinion of him beforehand go, hey, you know, that's great. Elon Musk sent some Starlinks. That's awesome. Had that gone on behind the scenes, we wouldn't have known. <laughs> and so, yeah. It, it's a great political move because it puts that into the forefront. And then if 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 Elon Musk says no, well, then everybody's like, well, God, what an asshole. You know, like, you know, so putting that in there, it's a smart, it's smart politics. Well, yeah. And we would have found out later on if he ended up doing that, we would have found out through a press release or just, you know, mm -hmm. anybody saying it, media covering it later on. We didn't see that. And I guess that's the conversation of this world war wired right now that people are using that before you never had, you know, two powers, one of the richest men in the world, you know, speaking with a leader during war and conflict and being able to side with each other. Um, it's really of, you know, warfare of the times. It's been incredible, uh, you know, because we're seeing this, we're seeing this war, we're seeing a war playing out in a lot of times in real time because of the fact that uh, people in Ukraine are able to upload videos so quickly, people are able to tweet, people are able to, you know, telegram it is very, very popular. Um, so you're able to get this information in like real time is what's going on. And so it's really remarkable because a lot of the information that uh, people were very limited to, you only got it at the six o'clock news or whenever, you know, you had CNN came on or whoever gave their little updates. That's the only time you knew what was going on. And it was always a real narrow snapshot and it was what they wanted to show you. But now we're at a position where this information is coming fast. It's coming, it's free flowing. And uh, anybody has access to it. It's it's really remarkable, uh, and, and this is you know, and arguably this is the first war we've ever seen fought in this regard. So even the wars in Afghanistan and Syria, you didn't have the same amount of coverage. You didn't have the social media coverage. You didn't have the investment like that that you see now. And so, uh, you know, some really incredible. It, it's allowed things that has. has improved and helped us on the reporting side you know there's some just phenomenal open source intelligence people who have painstakingly 
uh, are, are calculating and tabulating, you know, how many equipment losses each side has based on being able to verify it on new pictures and videos that come out. Uh, you know, or institutions like Bellingcat do just a phenomenal job of, of geolocating this where um, it, it's reporting on it is really interesting because I can uh, both talk to some people, you know, in Ukraine or on the ground, but then I have this just wealth of other information that really at my fingertips, I don't have to go anywhere. I can look at, uh, I can look at all that open source data. One, one area that's a big, um, I use frequently that, that helps corroborate all these things is uh, the, the NASA satellite data for their heat maps for wildfires tracking, because they oh, pick wow. up on heat signatures yeah. and fire. And so it's really, I mean, I've talked to a lot of my friends in, in the Intel world who are just like so much of Intel is now what's called OSINT, open source intelligence, because that information. So you even have professional intelligence organizations who are doing the same thing that you and I are doing, where we're like following it on Twitter and in Discord frequently. So it's, it's a surreal to see this all play out in real time. Yeah, it's, it's wild. It's something that I never thought, you know, in our generation, I guess we would see. And unfortunately we are. Um, my next question too, is about economic, um, Western economic sanctions that they're putting on Russia right now. And we're seeing that from all different countries. We're also seeing that Western countries are pulling corporations like McDonald's out of Russia. Um, so a question too, why, why are they doing that? And also, is it a ploy though, um, for, is it a tactic on behalf of the East to cross civil war within their own country? Um, not meaning that, you know, you can't get a Big Mac, you're going to start a civil war, but when you start pulling other sanctions and other things out, um, and economical sanctions, you're going to have people and unrest in that rival country. So where, where do you see that sure. playing out now and why are they doing that? <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. So we definitely we're we're looking at unprecedented sanctions being imposed on Russia and increasing. You know, it seems like every day somebody, uh, you know, some other country has been like, "Aha! I've thought of something new," and they've added this. You're like, "Oh my god!" And, and so what we're seeing here is, and I think it's important. And maybe we we didn't dig into this enough. Maybe when you first asked me the reasons behind why this is going on. Because uh, I just ended with with Putin's denazification is 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 BS, but the real reason that this is going on is because Ukraine, which is a former Soviet state, uh, was largely been viewed as the crown jewel of the Soviet Empire next to Russia, kind of, and uh, there's a lot of um, ideological links to that from the Russian people, particularly Vladimir Putin, where uh, you know Russian culture that we know it of as know of it today, modern culture originated in Kiev, it originated in Ukraine. So this, you know, uh, I've taught, tried to explain to people, for Americans, it would be like if uh, Washington DC suddenly became its own country and you're like, no, but that's where America, this is America. So there is this ideological um, pull there. And in addition to that, for, uh, for Vladimir Putin, in particularly, and this idea of Putinism, that really guides a lot of his thinkings, his behavior and opinions. Um, you know, he views Western uh, liberal democracies with absolute utter disdain. And I say liberal, de liberal de de democracies, if I can get it out, maybe I can't even say it. Uh, liberalism in the European sense, not in the American sense. Because you say liberal and people start thinking Republicans, Democrats in America, and then they're like, no, I, you know, Hillary go to jail. And they're like, no, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about European liberalism, which is this idea that people have individual rights, that they have constitutional protected freedoms, that they have a democratically, democratically accountable government. Uh, that is you know, different from how Vladimir Putin views it. And in fact, his view of, of what Russia needs to be a strong world power to kind of regain its place it lost in the collapse of the Soviet Union is a strong state and a strong government and a strong leader. So it's this extreme statism. But what you've seen in Ukraine, particularly since the Orange Revolution, and, and, and largely why you've seen him revert, revert to military action going in 2014, is the fact that the Ukrainian people as a whole have moved towards wanting this liberal democracy, where they, you know, they have a constitution, they have individual freedoms, they, they have a democratically elected government. And that's a very, that's very threatening 
to him. So not only do you have something that uh, you believe to really be a part of your integral to your Russian culture, really this belongs to me, uh, but now they're starting to move in a direction that you know, looks like your enemies, you know, <laughs> you're, you know, how dare you? And so that, that becomes even more concerning in the fact that uh, a large part of the younger population in Russia is likewise leaning that way. They don't want to become America. They don't want to become Canada. They don't want to become uh, the United Kingdom. They just want to, a, a government that they can elect, that they can hold accountable, that they can have protected rights, that they can say the word war without getting arrested. But they want that. And to Putin uh, in particular, and, and this kind of even goes back into your, your, your earlier question about is he mentally ill, um, that's not, you know, to him, and this comes from me watching him, listening to him and the things that he's said for years. And this is no, this is largely not just my interpretation. He, he clearly says it, uh, you know, he has a very low opinion of people in general and that they're largely easily manipulated, they're sheep. And so to him, he doesn't view Ukraine wanting to be free and, and wanting to be, he views that as a manipulation by the West. <laughs> and in fact, uh, you know, he, he largely blames the West for what's going on now, uh, because in his mind, the, if the West hadn't got involved and made these, manipulated these Ukrainians and people into wanting to have this liberal government, then they would be gladly opened arms, wanting to be part of the Russian empire. Like what is, you know, they've been duped or they've been manipulated. He, he it's, just his thinking. <laughs> he, he believes that. He doesn't believe in spontaneity. He doesn't believe protest uh, originate organically. Everything is a CIA plot. Everything is George Soros. Everything is a manipulation. And so, uh, you know, the West has to walk a fine line here because the first, so the first thing that you have is that in large part, the Western world, you know, is supposed to stand for democracy, freedom, people elect their leaders. Um, and so when you have a country that that's what they want, but they're invaded by another country who wants to take that from them, you know, how do you support them while walking the fine line of trying not to engage in what would be World War III? And so you, they have done that by providing military aid, significant military aid to Ukraine. So helping arm them, give them all these missiles, different anti-tank weapons. But then how can you equally strike Russia in a manner that's not going to provoke them into to starting World War III, at least in their mind. And, and economic sanctions provide this perfect opportunity because you're just hurting people's pockets, but you're not hurting them on the ground. You're not launching bombs at them. So, so the likelihood that you know Russia is going to launch a missile into Poland or Germany is very low. And so you launch economic sanctions into them uh, to try to put exactly the pressure that we see right now. It becomes so ec economically deprived. It becomes a, a really harsh environment um, where you're able to, to punish the leader through kind of how these punishing sanctions happen on the country itself. But uh, you know, at the same time, the idea that uh, it's being done to destroy Russia or break it apart, that, that is what Vladimir Putin says. <laughs> that, that is what he's telling his people and everything. Um, if that was the main goal of the West, well, they didn't need the war. <laughs> you know, they, they could have passed these sanctions before the war. If, if they wanted to destroy Russia economically, uh, there, you know, the, the war was just a pretext. You know, they could have done it beforehand. They could have done all these different things. So it's really a consequence of the war that's gone on. So it's one of these things that's uh, like, no, no, nobody wants to ruin your economy or destroy your country stop war, <laughs> stop invading people. And so the economic sanctions in themselves, they are punishment. They, they can uh, do significant harm to the economy of Russia. Uh, and it will probably make life very difficult uh, for the average Russian. And I think the unfortunate side of that is that it will not make life very difficult for Vladimir Putin or his inner circle who have been siphoning off billions from the Russian people already. Like they've got lots of money and lots of palaces to tuck away in. 
And so uh, those sanctions are really in hopes of trying to uh, put enough pressure on Putin to where the internal domestic unrest and, and the unrest of the, the wealthy people who are in Russia, the oligarchs, you know, they've sanctioned them specifically. People have probably seen that in the news where some of these oligarchs have had their yachts seized, this type of thing, um, in hopes that that will put pressure on Putin to end the war. I'm not certain it's going to be successful. Not that I don't think that the sanctions are a good way to go about it without starting World War III, but I don't know if that's going to be successful Yeah, with Putin. Right. And we're seeing like, from what I've heard is that, you know, Putin wants the West to come, you know, wants the States to potentially join into this war. So I, I have to ask then, you know, and it's a concern, I think for a lot of people, um, because there's talk about nuclear, you know, um, a, a massive World War III. Um, where are we at that right now? Currently, you know, we are the doomsday clock is a hundred seconds to midnight. Um, and that's happened multiple times. It's not one of the only times, obviously the cold war. I think even when, uh, Trump was running at one point, it was a hundred seconds to midnight. So it's, it's happened throughout right. history for us, but where are we currently right now? And are we looking at any nuclear war, you know, in the future? And I know that's mm -hmm. a very hard question to ask or to answer, I should say. Um, but where are your thoughts and feels and feelings on that? Sure. Well, <clears throat> the first thing that I think is really important, and I've tried hard to get this across to people, and, and if you read an article that I did um, titled uh, The Sermon of the Long Knives, uh, I put it out last week, I believe, and, and it was on Putin's most recent speech that he gave to uh, cabinet ministers. It was the most lengthy speech that he has given. Uh, since the war started. And I did an article on that. And I really broke that down in depth in everything that he said, because I, I thought it was very, very important for people to understand where Vladimir Putin's mind is right now, what he's thinking, and you know, where this could be headed. And, and the point that I wanted to make in that, and if you listen to Vladimir Putin, not just recently, but for years, is that Vladimir Putin it, this is not propaganda. This is not saying it for shock effect. He's not trying to dog whistle his supporters. He's not fear mongering his own people. He believes he is currently at war with the West. <laughs> so he has this idea that people are like, what if it becomes World War III? That's us. That's what we're worried about. That's not what he's worried about. That's already going on to him. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's again, it's, I can't stress enough. That's not propaganda. You know, when he go into, goes to bed and wakes up in the morning, he believes he is at war with the West right now. Now, one reason that people don't recognize that we're at war, or at least Putin thinks he's at war with the rest of the Western world, is because our definition of war isn't the same as Putin's. It isn't the same as with China, North Korea. You know, the Western world largely views war as an on-off switch. If what we see is going on in Ukraine, you know, where you have tanks battling each other, planes shooting each other, we are at war. War is on. If that's not going on, war is off. We're at peace. That is not how they view war. They view war as a, a continuous and constant thing that goes on. It's merely just how it's fought and where it's fought that differentiates it. So when you see uh, interference in, let's say, the 2016 elections in the United States or the interference in the French elections, um, you know, cyber attacks on Estonia, uh, the, the harassment and, and cyber attacks on Sweden, Finland, um, you know, Brit exit, you see all of this that, that went on with the UK, you see all these things? That's Russia at war with the West. <laughs> they're just using information, they're using psychological warfare, they're using uh, reflexive control, which means shaping the, the, the opinion and perception of the population to be favorable. They're just not launching bombs and shooting guns, but they're at war. And that's what they believe. Now, the reason they're doing that is because, you know, Vladimir Putin, and I stress, I say Putinism, because it's not just him. There are people in his inner circle that all share the same Putinist views. Uh, they believe they're at war as well. Uh, they believe that, you know, if there's, if 20,000 people go into Moscow's Red Square and protest the war, saying no war, they believe that that is orchestrated by the CIA. These people have been manipulated. They believe that to their core. 
<laughs> they're not just saying that they believe it and so to them when they see that so when they see civil unrest when they see uh, prominent opposition figures emerge like uh, Netlavi, who, who's currently in prison, who, who Putin tried to have killed, uh, tried to have poisoned, he survived, came back and they arrested. They view those as foreign agents. Like they believe that this is, you know, they, they don't believe that, that it could be a result of their own governance or that people could have their own opinion of how they should be treated. And so Putin believes he's at war right now. <laughs> and in fact, in that speech, I went in depth in that article um, you know, he clearly says that, you know, he believes that, that Ukraine is merely a vassal of the United States and the West and a proxy state of it. And that, you know, essentially the United States has propped all this up. They've made Ukraine do this. Um, so to them, they are fighting the West. The battlefield just happens where the bombs are following is in Ukraine. But in their mind, <laughs> they're dropping them on the West in Ukraine, if that makes sense. You know, to them, Ukraine's already a vassal of it. So we're already there <laughs> with them. I think that's the thing that needs, everybody should understand. They're already there when it comes to Putin and the people that are in power, they're already at war with the West. Now, the question is, would that be willing to extend that battlefield to Poland, to Germany, to Estonia, any of the, any of the other, um, you know, Western, especially NATO states. Right now, that's not in a you know, in their risk reward matrix. So that's why why are they attacking you know Canada, the United States with information warfare, trying to you know cyber hacking, uh, interference with with uh, elections, because that's in their risk reward matrix. They believe that they can defeat the United States, or at least they could resist anything that would come back their way. They know that. You know, Canada is not going to launch a bomb at, at Moscow if they hack into to their government systems. So they're like, okay, cool. The you know, worst they're going to do, they're going to try to hack us. Oh, well, that's war. That's the way they view it. And so the idea of getting into a large scale, uh, kinetic, intense, uh, high intense warfare with, with NATO is that risk greatly outweighs the reward. So they're not going to do that right now. <laughs> that's not in their equation. Now, could something change where they feel like that risk reward is different? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Uh, you know, what could that change look like? Uh, you know, it, the change could be that they, you know, somehow pull this off and you know, absorb all of Ukraine. Ukraine becomes part of Russia. You know, I know that that he Vladimir Putin has claimed that's not what they plan on doing, but he again. Up until the 23rd, said he wasn't invading. Uh, so they, they in, are emboldened in that. They absorb this other country with uh, rich mineral resources, rich industrial resources. You know, this was Ukraine is in an area that has significant material resources for manufacturing. That's why, uh, you know, aside from being in uh, the Soviet Union, but that's why Nazi Germany in 1941 wanted, not only went into Ukraine, but wanted to hold on to it desperately because it, it, provided such key industrial uh, material resources they needed. So you've got all of this going in there and uh, you, you learn from your past mistakes, which they're making a lot of them right now. And then you're emboldened and think, well, now I want to take back Poland. You know, now I want Estonia. Could that happen? It's hard to predict. It, is it something that they want? Is it something that, I, that Vladimir Putin wants to do? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. Th those conditions are being set. If you read um, uh, Ukrainian media, uh, or excuse me, if you read Russian state media, they're already setting those conditions. And, and I think, again, I can't, I, I need to finish translating Putin's entire speech into English for people, uh, but it, though I transcribed a lot of it in that article, but, but I really, I hope that I, 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 will, I will do that and we'll get that uploaded on our debrief channel with the English subtitles. Because it's something I think a lot of people in the West need to watch so they can listen to what he's saying and listen to the emotions and hear the things he's saying, you know, when he's saying things like, uh, you know, finding a, um, you know, finding a final solution for the Ukrainian problem. That's, you know, that is 1942 Nazi Germany. 
You know, that's the, the, the final solution to the Jewish question is exactly that, that's what the Nazis used to justify genocide. I mean, they're using these language and they're also using it in their state media now for, you know, how do we solve the Polish question and this type of thing. And so they're setting the conditions there, whether it'll get reach that point or not, I don't know. But, but people should make no mistake in, in thinking, I think that's not to sound like an alarmist, but why, uh, to some extent, when you've heard Ukraine saying, you know, this isn't just a Ukrainian war and this is just, could, you know, Ukraine could be a doorway for Russia into the rest of your country. They're not wrong. <laughs> but they at least want that. Vladimir Putin at least wants that to happen. And I was going to ask you too, you've been throughout this interview, you've been talking about, you know, Nazi Germany and World War II. And I was going to ask you the comparisons of dictatorships. And it seems like Putin's taking a cue from, unfortunately, from Hitler. Um, you know, what other things do you see him using tactical wise um, that are similar to other past military uh, tactics or strategy that he's currently using? And is there anything new that has never really been seen before? Well, okay, first of all, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because th this, this theme of Nazism and World War II has been prominent, uh, frankly, because of Putin and Russia. I mean, they keep bringing it up. They're denazifying. There's a reason for that that I think a lot of people in the Western world don't realize as much. And, and that has to do with the fact that um, World War II, we, we pay attention to it in, in the United States, in Canada, in the UK. You know, it's a big deal. It's a big part of European history, but not to the same extent that Russia does. Uh, Russia really, really, you know, World War II is a big deal for them. In fact, you know, it's called the Great Patriotic War. And to their credit, uh, you know, because I, I don't want to make, I don't want to ever come across like I am speaking poorly about the Russian people, Russian history, the culture, right. because there's really some fantastic things. And they, they do have every right to have a lot of uh, extreme pride in what they achieved in World War II, because without Russia, uh, you know, we, we probably would have been able to defeat Hitler, but they played an integral role. And moreover than that, um, you know, the Russian people in World War II suffered more than anyone else. You know, they, 20 million Russians were, were killed, you know, just wholesale murder by the Nazis because they wanted to make uh, what's called Livindras, Leibendrum, living space. Uh, you know, they wanted to eradicate all the people so they could move Germans in. They wanted living space. And so uh, you, you have this, this idea of crafting this narrative to where Russia is fighting the Nazis because, you know, this is, you know, even, in a, even in the Western world, fighting Nazis is a good thing, but to, to Russians, it's a really good thing because they tried to eradicate their people just like they did the Jews. Um, but at the same time, what's bizarre is watching, you're, you're watching parallels as well that do, uh, you know, I hate using the, the World War II Nazi analogies because they get overused. You know, everybody's a Nazi if you argue with them long enough on, on Twitter or Facebook. But as someone who, out of all the warfare, uh, you know, World War II history is by far where the most of my focus has been and interest in. And I look at a lot of what I'm seeing now and think, God, that's really disturbing, you know, down to the fact of using symbology to whip up the masses and, and you know just last week you know i jokingly said it but i'm only half joking when when putin held what i call was his nuremberg rally where they had 200,000 russians they packed in the stadium waving flags and it's like this is you know we've been here before we're, we're <laughs> yeah like this is this is fanaticism and so there are elements of it and again understandably so um <laughs> not to not to make it sound like he's walking in Hitler's footsteps. There are aspects that we see mimicked by Nazi behavior uh, by dictators. By we see it in Russia right now. We see it with Putin because they're highly effective propaganda. They're highly effective in creating feelings of nationalism. And so Nazi Germany used a lot of these things <laughs> to create it. To, to fund this racist, you know, genocidal worldview. I don't th think that's what Putin's doing, but he, you know, he is equally using those same types of tactics that, that were able to whip up the masses in Germany at the time to become fascists and <laughs> to follow the leader into this, to follow him into what he's doing. So you see that. 
uh, on the battlefield, uh, and I think has been easily the most surprising thing for, for everyone here. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, what are we seeing here that's parallels to, to historical examples? A lot more than we thought. You know, this is not some kind of modern war that we're seeing where you're using really fancy, sophisticated stealth bombers and technology. We're seeing World War II style grinding uh, ground warfare with tanks. And in particular, you know, I don't think anybody, if you'd asked me two months ago what this war would look like now that we're here four weeks later, I don't think I would have said we were looking at what we're looking at now, uh, which is quite frankly, um, an utter dumpster fire by the Russian military. It has been, you know, along all phases, you know, I've talked to defense friends or I talked to friends in the intelligence community or defense community, and everybody's just been like, holy cow, this was bad. You know, it still continues to be bad. Um, and so we've learned a lot about the Russian military <laughs> in the past month. And I can't stress enough that uh, so much of what we've seen, well, first of all, let's not take anything away from the Ukraine the Ukrainians, they have put up defense that I don't think anybody could predict it. And covering this for a month, um, truly, I don't see how anybody who kind of believes in freedom and believes in people having a sovereign right to their own culture and identity can't really look in, at the Ukrainians, have a lot of respect for them, because you're looking at them and go, even in these occupied yeah. areas, their civil protests, like you're like, Wow, you know, and, and I mean, uh, I can the tractors see why become so many iconic. Americans. Yeah, the tractors become yes. iconic. <laughs> yes, yeah, this yeah. Is, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the American fetish, our, our revolution where we fight for freedom, but we're watching this in 2022, and these people really are fighting and dying for it. And, and you know, it, it's, it's surreal, but at the same time, inspiring. Uh, but not to take anything away from that, we have also just seen a complete failure on, uh, on Russia's side of things to the point where it's not fair to really say, assess how, how well or how poorly the Russian troops have done themselves. Uh, uh, being fair to everybody and objective, um, though they have, you know, I already I reported it this Monday and said their initial military campaign, it, it, it's they failed. It's it's failed now. So the initial campaign to seize Kiev and force a regime change is over. Like that part of the military campaign, it's not happening anymore. Like they have failed that objective. So now they have to move to another objective. But you know, looking at that objectively, are we, we can't really blame the Russian soldiers and their performance. It, because we don't know how they will perform, because they have been placed in this situation where I, I've never seen worse planning, worse strategy. Like I find myself, and I spent a considerable time this morning trying to figure out who the hell is running this campaign. Like, who's is there a you know, what is the chain of, what is the span of control here? Do they have an overall commander in charge? And I can't find one. I don't know. And you look at it and go, I mean, across all phases of it, uh, they, uh, we, we can't tell how well the, the Russian troops are capable of performing because they just, they were not provided with the opportunity. They were inappropriately applied. Um, they don't have enough gas, they don't have enough food, they don't have all of these things that you need uh, to fight a warfare campaign. They can't fly their jets right now. And I think that's one of the things that surprised a lot of defense people is where the hell is their air force? A month later, Ukraine still maintains 60% of their air force and superiority over their skies. And you're going, where's the Russian air force? I mean, if you look at net power between these two countries, it's not even comparable. And where are they? And, and the, the simple fact of the matter is they can't de-conflict the airspace, meaning 
they can't fly their planes in the airspace without risking get them getting shot down by their own people because they can't be conflicted. They can't differentiate who's who. They can't communicate. They're using regular Radio Shack walkie talkies that are being intercepted by, uh, you know, people at home. You know, somebody in Canada can sit there on a computer and listen in in real time. And in some cases, even interject in the middle of a battle, like they can interject and, and disrupt their communications. And, and you know, it's, <laughs> it's wild. Well, it also sounds like they're, they're not prepared, but they're using other, if they're, so if they're using, you know, walkie talkies right now, and, you know, in, in a state of our world that has so much technology that we don't have to use that, but they're using other missiles now, like hypersonic missiles and other weapons. Can you talk about then the weapons that they're using now? Um, and will those weapons then lead to, to Putin being um, punished for war crimes? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, as we're learning with most of this, so much of the weapons that they claim to have or capabilities they have is all make believe like it's all propaganda and i can't tell you i find myself asking this constantly have they immersed themselves in so much bs they believe it now or do they know it you know because it's like you know are they are they really just unaware of where the real situation is but we've saw this we see this and this is a good example of how, how um, let's say, passive propaganda is used, uh, where you know, Ukraine also engages in passive propaganda. Some of the examples I gave to you, but this is a good example of passive propaganda on the part of uh, Russia. Russia last week announced that they had used the first ever hypersonic missile. They, you know, blah, blah, blah. A lot of media ran with it. A lot of people were like, yeah, you know, yeah, they've used it. Great headline, great headline, great headline. They didn't use a hypersonic missile. They used an airdrop Eichsender missile. It's basically a land missile that they already have that they just launched from an airplane. Not hypersonic. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's maybe cool, you know, and, and to an extent, I don't know what the actual speed of it was, but, but everybody in the, in the real defense technology world was like, that's not a hypersonic missile. That's not a, you know, they just launched a really fast missile from a plane is what they did. And so they called it hypersonics. So you're like, you know, again, it sounds fancy. It, it's got this, it sounds fancy. And so um, you look at that, you know, first of all, what is the idea that they're going to elevate and use more advanced weapons? I don't know that they have them. <laughs> and, you know, for that example, they, they, they might fire some more fancy fast missiles from a plane and call them something. Uh, but but we're seeing on the ground now, you're, you're seeing a, a significant drop in precision guided munitions, meaning the munitions that kind of kind of surgically strike and just strike one building. Um, we've seen a huge drop in that in the last two weeks. And no one knows why for certain, but you know, I've spoken to people at, in the Pentagon who say that it, they think they're running low. They're starting to run out of precision guided munitions. That's why they resorted to what's called long range fires or indiscriminate fires, which is artillery, uh, dumb bombs, gravity bombs. You just drop them, they fall wherever they fall. Um, they're using that kind of stuff now because they don't have precision guided munitions. And, and more importantly, the ones that they had when they started the war weren't good. You, you, you could look on the satellite images of where they attempted to bomb and take out the airports and stuff to, to cut off uh, Ukraine's capability to fly and use their airport, they missed, <laughs> you know, you would see these bomb craters, you know, 30, 40 yards, 30, you know, they missed. And, and so I, I just talked to somebody at the Pentagon today who told me that uh, they had assessed that 60% of their short and medium range missiles. So these are the missiles they're firing from the missile launchers. They were big trucks. They love to parade them down the road, them in North Korea, you know, everybody cheers. 60% of them have failed. 60% have not wow. lost their target. And so- That's a high number too. That's a really high number. Well, compared to what you look at with the, um, 
let's say the Javelin missile, which is the shoulder rocket missile that the United States has provided Ukraine to where they're destroying all these tanks. Such a, I mean, it, it, it has become one of the most decisive weapons in war simply because you, know, you, you right now, Chrissy, could go out and destroy a tank with this one device, you know, from a good range away. And the device is really what's called fire and forget, meaning you fire it and then you can run and hide. And, and the missile itself seeks the tank out, will go up and, and attack the top of the tank so that you're able to, where the armor is the thinnest. So it attacks the top of the tank where the armor is the thinnest. And with Russia, a couple of things are happening. One, their tanks are designed. So the United States M1 Bradley tanks, where you keep your ammo and everything, is in a ballistic proof kind of a container within the tank. So if the tank gets hit and blows up, that doesn't blow up. Russia's are in this kind of rotary um, auto loader dial that's around the gunner and the crew. So when the tank goes in, all of your bombs inside of there are <laughs> surrounding you and your crew. And we've seen some just catastrophic damage. I've never seen such violent damage where these tanks are blown to pieces. Uh, and so there's a really sophisticated piece of hardware and you're looking at it. I think the last that I saw was something like 92% kill rate. So 92% of these javelins that are being fired have destroyed wow. a tank. And whereas 60% of these missiles are, are not reaching their targets. And I think, I, I don't know that it's been officially confirmed. I think there's some dissension that that hypersonic, miss, hypersonic missile that they said they launched didn't reach where they said it did, that it didn't land in a munitions depot, like it said, that it landed in a field, a farmer's field or something. But so there's a lot of capabilities we keep seeing. And I got this a lot at the beginning of the war where people are like, well, maybe they're just bringing out the dud stuff. You know, where's the good stuff? And that would just make people like myself. <laughs> so many people like myself and others had to say, but this is it. This is it. And uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know whether it goes back to the poor planning and strategy. There's, there's a wealth of information that suggests, uh, I've called this decision a, a Fuhrer bunker decision, going back to the Hitler analogies, right. that uh, this was a decision made by Putin and a very small, small, small section of his inner circle, that the majority of your, your field and company grade commanders in, in the Russian military did not know they were about to invade. They did not prepare for invasion mentally and both equipment wise. And, and so there, there's been too many Russian soldiers who've been captured really early on in the war who were saying they thought it was an exercise. They didn't know, like they didn't know. They didn't even tell these kids what they were going into. So there was zero preparation for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you not being able to mentally prepare for that. And, and we're seeing that now on the ground. I mean, just before we got to this interview, I, I just got word about a, uh, a brigade commander, a colonel in the Russian military who was killed. And they found out through recorded wiretap intercepts of cell phone calls that it looks like he was killed by his own troops that ran him over because they were, they had taken significant losses. Like they were done. <laughs> They're like, I'm going to kill this guy before I go out here and get any more of us killed. And we're seeing that and that's where their campaign, it's hard for me to envision a lot of paths for success for them now, because they're, you know, there's a version of events that, that the Kremlin wants to happen and believes, maybe they even believe is happening. And then there's what's really going on on the ground. And you're going to see the troops on the ground at the, at the end of the day, you, you've got to want to fight for what you're fighting for. You got to really want to go in there and fight and to die for, and you're not seeing that their morale is really low. And when you've lost faith in your leadership and you're running them over with tanks, you know, this is, you're in a bad position. So much of warfare is not just about guns and, and who's got the fanciest equipment. It's, it's in the people who are using them. And it's the, it's the mentality and the mindset and the willingness, determination to fight. And I'd say that's a huge factor in what we're seeing in either side here. I think there's probably a lot of Russian kids who are in Ukraine right now who are wondering, why am I here? Why are we fighting this war? 
why are we yeah. doing this? <laughs> Then my last question before we wrap this up then is I know Zelensky and uh, Putin are looking to have a conversation and Zelensky said that he's ready to speak now. Where do you think that's going to end up um, after that conversation? Where is that going to lead to? Do you think we're going to have think you know, maybe a settlement? No. no. Okay. We're not going to, I don't think that so conversation what's next is going to occur. Then what's, what's next after that conversation? Does, does the West get involved then? I think that's the question. I mean, that's the $10 million question, right? Where is this yeah. going to go and how is it going to end? Yeah. And there's not a good answer for that. And I think I've looked at that and, and you know, I, I try to put out the, these daily or every other day kind of breakdowns of what's the situation going on there. What, what are the key things to watch out for and everything? And, and again, I, I go back to that, um, that, that Sermon of the Long Knives article that I mentioned. Um, if you read that, understand where his mind is, listen to what he's saying, understand that he's saying it in Russian to his cabinet ministers on Kremlin TV. This is not for you. This is not to intimidate CNN. It's not to intimidate anybody else. He is, he's speaking his mind. <laughs> he's telling you up front. People try to interpret it as him thinking something else. He's being clear here. Um, you know, he views this as a war with the West. Um, he, I do not believe this is a war that he thinks he can lose. I don't think he, you know, can take that chance. Um, I don't at this point see an off ramp that's easy. You know, they're currently, like I mentioned, the first, the, the initial campaign of this war has accumulated there. There's the chances of seizing Kiev and forcing a regime change or that's out the window right now. So they're going to engage in, in a protracted warfare, kind of a warfare of attrition, where they hunker in and try to shoot bombs from afar and, and dig in into this long war. I frankly don't know that they can do that either. And, and I think if anyone um, knows better, it's Russia. You know, Russia, that is how Russia defeated Nazi Germany, was a war of attri attrition. That is how Russia defeated Napoleon. <laughs> they know that wars of attrition don't favor the, the conqueror. And they're, they're still suffering losses. And, and Ukraine, as we're speaking right now, is engaging in counterattacks to kind of maneuver that out. So they don't have the reserves. They don't have the people to feed into them. Um, you know, potentially, they've lost as many as, as seven to 15,000 or more. Uh, you know, that's just who's been killed. Uh, I, I saw the last estimate by NATO, which, as shocking as it sounds, I believe to be pretty accurate that 40,000 Russians have either been killed, injured, taken POW, or missing at war right now. You don't have the reserves to, to fill that in. So how do you maintain that fight? Um, I don't know how you do. Right. <laughs> I mean, normal circumstances, you realize this has failed. It's time to bring out, let's, let's try to get the simplest, you know, some type of save face little agreement and let's call it a day. Uh, but he's not signaling that, you know, he's mm -hmm. signaling that he's fully committed. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier and we didn't even, really, I didn't even answer it. I apologize is, you know, what about nukes? Could he use nuclear weapons? Um, right now? No. I mean, I, maybe I'm in the minority there. I think that that's, that's, Discussion of where we could be headed, could we see nuclear warfare is probably, we wouldn't have to do a whole episode on that because that's another really nuanced topic. For sure. And I, you know, before when they were saying that that was possible and, you know, they were saying like he was kind of peacocking or showing strength. I use that lightly, you know, showing strength when he was talking about um, using nuclear, but that's a tactic that's always done um, and has been done before. It doesn't mean that we're on some nuclear high alert, but we are seeing those conversations about, you know, being prepared or understanding what does that mean? Um, because, you know, we've had examples of it in the cold war and it's something that people are discussing now, but I agree. I hope we're, we're nowhere close to that. I really hope. I think all I of us hope. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the thing that's most important there, and he realizes that, you know, um, you know, and people always say, oh my God, the Russia's got nukes, they've got nukes. They've got... Well, well, so does the West. Yeah, <laughs> and they've got a lot of true. them. And, they've got... and if you were to compare the, the military performance of the Western militaries in recent conflicts, um, you know, you can look at the invasion in Iraq, 
you know, the, the US military and its allies they tend to turn things into dumpster fires whenever they go in. And then after they invade a country, they decide they're going to try to spread democracy and freedom and world and, and engage in these kind of rebuilding campaigns. Uh, and, but in terms of the actual military part of it, which is the invasion and, and, and taking over, they've done really well. You know, they've done exceptional well on that side of it, where Russia has not done good at all. Uh, and so you look at that, if you were to look at that and just kind of compare military capabilities in that regard, well, then people in the West should feel pretty good about our nuclear capabilities, our nuclear deterrence capabilities, our ability to strike them back. And I think Russian, you know, I think Putin knows that. I think you're looking at it, uh, looking at the performance of his own troops and what he's seen just in conventional. I think you look at the number, 60% of your, your short and, and, and some of those short, the, those Iskanders and Kavar missiles that have, uh, you know, 60% that have failed, those are missiles that could have nuclear warheads attached to them. So those missiles are, are outfitted so you could put a nuclear warhead attached to it. 60% of them failed. <laughs> so you're looking at that. That's not, and that's not, those are ones that are on trucks going short, medium range. We are not talking about an intercontinental ballistic missile that has to go into space to reach right. North America, something like that. I'm thinking, you know, if I'm <laughs> Vladimir Putin, I'm looking at that going, you know, it's okay to saber rattle because they do. They portray themselves. Mm -hmm. Putin portrays himself as a, as a reckless nuclear power. You know, he, right. he, he wants to look like the crazy drunk that will just come into the bar and start fighting everybody. Um, doesn't mean he will. And so... But you're looking at that going, how confident am I? How confident am I that if I launched an ICBM and it lands in the middle of the Atlantic, <laughs> and now all of a sudden, how confident am I that now I've got to not just worry about the United States, I've got to worry about all of NATO. And right now, they have no allies. They have, it's Russia <laughs> standing alone. And so I think you look at that, and, and this is my my personal justification why you wouldn't see nuclear uh, war, nor do I see, would I see anything where Putin would provoke the West and NATO intentionally is because you would, he would recognize that would potentially spell, likely spell the end of the Russian Federation, the end of his reign, it would be catastrophic. And I can't see him risking that to not lose something he didn't have before he invaded. They didn't have Ukraine beforehand, you know. So, are you right. willing to are you willing to risk everything for something you didn't have beforehand? I don't. Well, I don't, he, does I don't he feels think entitled so. to it to the USSR, you know, does he, from past. He, he and then maybe you're right. His, yeah, I think he feels that maybe it's still he, his because of that. I don't know, but I'm repeating. But you're right. I would imagine that's, actually, that's, that's a part of it. That's a great counterpoint. Is maybe he's saying no, it is mine. I did lose it, but it's really mine. And so I'm going to get it back at all costs. That's a, that is, actually, that's an excellent counterpoint. And maybe so. I mean, it's just hard. Is that we could talk, there could be an entire episode. And frankly, sure. there are really good uh, nuclear strategists, nuclear policy, nuclear strategies, an entire discipline. And there's people that just do that. I'm not one of those people. And so my, my ideas of where it could go to nuclear war depends on listening to some of those people and, and reading books. And uh, unfortunately, where I'm good at and we're looking at tactics and military and strategy right. and what's going on there, we fortunately don't have, we have two examples of nuclear war use. So everything's theoretical. So it's hard. It's hard to predict. Right. And, it, but, you know, even understanding tactics and understanding defense strategies is, is part and parcel, I would say of that, you know, it doesn't mean that you're studying nuclear all the time and what's going to go on in that type of defense, but I would imagine they cross over at times. So say so nukes doesn't mean that you just blow up New York or you blow, you know, you do what happened uh, to end World War II. You, you have this Hiroshima type explosion. There are tactical nukes and, and, and Russia has a lot of those. They primarily focus on those where you, could you see Russia use a tactical nuclear weapon aimed at a military target in the field? So they try to wipe out, uh, you know, a portion, a brigade of, of Ukraine's forces with a tactical nuke. Maybe, you know, maybe it does reach that point. And, and um, but in those instances, those would be what's called low yield tactical type nuclear weapon where um, I think the, the, the unfortunate side of that is that um, 
know, if they did that and they only hit a military target like that, I don't know that that would be a red line for NATO. Uh, you know, they would look at it as, eh, it's war. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> thank you so much, Tim. It's a great, but honestly, it's been a great conversation. Um, and so thank sure, you also, anything. you're the first person from the debriefing on here. So that makes me happy and more to come, but thank you so much. And as I say to everybody, thank you for being rebelliously curious with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs>